great. Love that so much. Oh, man, I know this is going to drive some people nuts, and I apologize uh, on the front end. I'm going to invite everyone, for all who are able to stand back up. I'm going to keep you on your toes a little bit. I'm Pat. I'm the other co-lead pastor here alongside Neely. If, if you've been tracking with us for maybe the last year or so, um, you probably have recognized there's a passage of Scripture that's very meaningful to us. It's kind of been a bit of a guide and a rudder of who we're becoming, what we're going after. And so I would love if we can just all, not just in here, but if you're at home or wherever you may be, on the Peloton or something, uh, let's all recite this together. It's from Isaiah 58, and it's from the paraphrase version of Scripture written by Eugene Peterson, The Message. Um, but, but, but let's not just kind of go through the motions by saying it. As we're saying it, and as we're seeing it on screen, as we're hearing it from the voices of those nearest us, let's believe this. Let's, like, declare this. And so let's, let's do this together. Right here, starting right here. One, two, three. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, Quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadow lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I will give you a full life in the emptiest of places. Firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. May it be so, amen. All right, you may be seated, you may be seated. Oh, it's so good. If that resonates with you, if you are new or newer to Overlake and that's resonating, just know that's what this church community is about. And so it's a huge invitation. Anyone can participate in what God's up to. And what we know is that this is true. This is what we long for, not just at a, a communal level, collectively, but even at a personal level. And that's really what this series that we're in is getting at. Because if you noticed where it started in this verse where we just recited this right here together, it, it starts out with, then when you pray, I like to point out, not if you pray, but then when, when you pray, God will answer, not might answer, but will answer. But check this out. You'll call out for help and I'll say, this is God saying, and I'll say, God saying, here I am. The good news is this, God hears, God responds, and God is present. And the good news is also this, if you know how to say help, it's all it takes. And that's what it's about. And that's what it's about. And that's what we're talking about is that we've all had to ask for help at some point in our lives. We've all come to the limits of really our own limitations or abilities. We've all realized that maybe that change that we want to see in the world, we can't bring on ourselves. And if we're honest... It's also true of in our inner lives. There's change that I'm sure we all desire to see in our own hearts and minds and lives, but we realize even with the most willpower, even if we white knuckle it, we can't make it happen. And yet God can. And it starts by asking for help. And that's really what we're talking about. There, there's a great illustration of this. This went viral, I think like uh, about eight years or so ago, a few years back. And it was the Brazil version of uh, MasterChef, a TV show. And there's this moment where a contestant, she's frantically, I mean, time is ticking down, right? It's like you've got to finish your dish in a certain amount of time. And she's having a hard time opening a jar of ingredients that she needs to finish her dish. And, and you can tell, like, like the camera shots are showing the judges, and they're like freaking out and all nervous. And then, and then it shows the balcony and the family and the friends, and they're getting all like fidgety. And she's trying so hard to get this thing open. And, and, and she realizes she needs help. And so let's watch this together. Let's see how it ends. But I think this is a perfect metaphor. So let's watch this. <laughs> Vai que dá tempo, vamos lá. Aí, tá aqui que eu vou. Que... Que... Caramba, hein? Fura, fura a tampa, fura a tampa. Fura, 
that's ever had to open a jar, it's like, yes, okay. But man, is that not true? Like, think, think of the metaphor. Uh, perhaps there's areas in your life, and it feels like precious time is slipping by. You know you'll only grace this planet for so long. And, and, and there are areas that are stuck, and yet if you seek out the right help in the context of a community that is for you and with you and in it with you, God can can loosen and unlock and lift off those areas where you, you, you get to experience the fullness of the life that you've been promised in Jesus Christ. And so we all have hurts or habits or hang-ups. We all have issues or different things that are getting in the way of that freedom. And so this is where to just catch everyone up, again, if you're just coming and joining us, the first two weeks we first talked about the just Stepping out of denial phase, it, getting to a place of just admitting that you need help. That was week one. Week, week, week two was last week. Pastor Neely talked about the importance of with the help of the Spirit, with the help of God, going through just a really brave self-examination. Being open and honest with those areas in our lives that we want to submit to God. And, and if you didn't know, every week we're providing a, a one-page resource for further application and reflection that we're inviting you to do. It's, it's online. You can access it online. You can request on the connection card. You'll get an email from me if you do that tomorrow. But we want to not just talk about this. We want to practice this. We want to do this as a community. So this week, what's this week on? <laughs> Confession. And everyone's like, amen, preach, let's go. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's funny, we have family in town from Spokane, right here, right here in the middle. Spokane stands in the house. So, uh, so we, got, we got some family. Yes, well, you can, it's okay to welcome the Hebdens, that's right. Uh, last, last night, Jake's like, oh, so what, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I'm like, confession. You know, kind of like, is that a buzzkill? Do you guys still want to come or not? But here's what I think we recognize. This is brave work. It, it's a little scary. It can, it can be a little scary. It requires some vulnerability. But let me tell you, let me remind you, you're going to be okay. And this work is actually necessary to experience freedom. Yes, uncomfortable, but oh, so good. So let's do this. Let's pray, and then, and then we'll dive in together. Lord, help. Help us. Help me. Help every person hearing these words in this room, online, at home, at a future date. We are saying we want your help. And so lead us. Show up in ways that maybe we're un <laughs> not even anticipating or expecting. But, but we want you to lead. In your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we'll start with some scripture. And rather than going volume and throwing like 30 different passages I picked one verse, and we're just going to do a deep dive into one verse today. And, and the one verse is found in the, the letter from James to uh, kind of the diaspora of Jews at the time. James uh, chapter 5, verse 16. In the NLT, it reads this. And oh, by the way, this is the half-brother of Jesus, okay? Pretty, pretty cool. But here, here, here's how James writes. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Let, let, let me remind you, the word confess is a verb. It's an action. It's to proclaim or state something with, with utter honesty. It's to, to openly acknowledge, even joyfully, in fact, actually, when you see how this, this word gets used, to, to profess that someone will, will perhaps do something or to promise. There's, there's a sense of agreement. But, but it's spoken. It's proclaimed. It's, a, it's again, it's a verb. I, I love, there's, there's a translation of scripture that, that, that over the past year I've just so fallen in love with. It's, it's called the First Nations Version of the New Testament. Actually, I have it right here if you want to see what it looks like. But it, it, it's an English Bible. And, and, and it connects culturally in a relevant way to, to the traditional heart languages of the First Nations of where we live. Over six million English-speaking First Nations or native tribes, indigenous peoples to, the, to North America. And... And I have to tell you, it, is, it has been very profound to get to read Scripture in, in, in really a, a, a new way, in a fresh way. And so I want you to hear this verse from this translation of Scripture. 
It says, so admit your broken ways. I love that. I'll come back to that in a moment. Admit your broken ways one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. And if you notice, the, 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 the books of the Bible in this translation aren't actually how we have probably come to know them. It just says what the letter is. James, the, the, the name James means he leads the way. And who's James writing to? The, the scattered tribes, the, the diaspora of the Jews. And, and so it's really funny. If you, if you look at Titus, the name of that book is uh, small man, a letter from small man to big man. Uh, and, and, and so it's just giving, again, kind of the meaning of names, which then when you read the genealogies, like in Matthew, it is so beautiful. It's so, you get the depth of what's happening. But the message isn't about that. It's here, here, we're moving, we're moving. So let's break this down. Let's just go word by word, kind of phrase by phrase. So here, here's where it starts. Here's where it starts for James. These two words. So admit. Well, we've talked about that. That's, again, we've, we've, we've kind of started there. It's, again, stepping out of denial. It's really the combination of kind of week one and week two. You know, one of my favorite quotes is actually from uh, Dr. Jamar Tisby. He, he says this, and I think it's helpful to see the progression of how these things track and kind of stack on each other. He says, you know, history and scripture teaches us that there can be no reconciliation, which is, again, this end point, this, this healing, right, without repentance. And then he kind of draws it back, right? And there can be no repentance without confession, which is our subject today. And there can be no confession without truth. This is why we spend time in self-examination. And it's true whether you're doing justice work related to racial reconciliation or if you're doing that deep inner healing work that we need at an individual level. But it's the same. We need truth to know what we're confessing. And there can be no actual repentance until we actually know what we're repenting of. And then that begets a beautiful and hard and long and slow journey of reconciliation. But that's what James is outlining in his own words right here. So now moving forward, it's this next phrase. So admit your broken ways. I love that. Your broken ways. That's what sin is, you guys. That's what sin does. Sin is the tearing apart of that which is made to be whole and beautiful. There's a brokenness that sets in into God's good and beautiful creation. And that's the good news of what Jesus has come. That there's hope. Things won't stay that way. In fact, even now, Jesus is making how many things new? Yeah. How many things new? It's okay. Repeat the, repeat the word you're hearing around the people. They got it right. How many things is, is, is God making new? Yes, that's right. There's healing that's come and coming and will come in completion. Us to God, us to one another, us to the whole of creation, us to our truest selves even. We are being healed and changed. It's good news. Here's our problem. And I'm saying our. I'm, I'm taking ownership in this as well. We are quite well practiced at admitting other people's broken ways. Am I right? Perhaps even when they're not around. Yeah? You guys, that's got to stop. That's got to stop. That's not what James is encouraging at all. Gossip can be incredibly addicting, just like any other addiction out there. It not only is a problem itself, it creates that many more problems. So we're going to do something we did two weeks ago. Just make sure we're all tracking. Give me two thumbs up. Two thumbs up, everybody. Here we go. No middle fingers. Man in the back, just thumbs, please. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and we're going to do this. Point them at this person in your life. Point them at this person. Not to the person behind you. This person. That's right. James is saying, you're admitting this person's broken ways. What are the things that you have done or not done? Said or not said? Sins of omission or commission. This is the, really the aspect of taking ownership of the things that we are responsible for. Broken ways of thinking or talking or behaving. Broken ways that we've treated others or creation or ourselves. Broken ways that we have worshipped or trusted anything other than God in our lives. Such as money. Right? 
And once we do this, we get to then this next stage. Here's where James leads us. So admit your broken ways one to another. Here's what's fascinating. So this means not only are we in the role of confessor, of sharing our own brokenness and areas where there's really that tearing that has taken place, we are also, each of us, we're part of a royal priesthood, we're each of us to be people who are safe and trusted to hear the confession of others. All of us. There's two roles that, that James is getting at as he's writing this verse. We are to be people that hear the broken ways as people are sharing with us. There's a huge problem that holds us back from, from really both aspects, being able to share and actually being trusted by others to hear. And it's this human tendency to define people by the worst things that they've done. We do it. We, we do it of others because generally we end up doing it of ourselves. And we fear condemnation. We fear we'll be cut off or canceled. We fear, what if I'm deemed unlovable? What if I'm not enough? What if I'm told, you can't belong here? It's one of the most primitive human instincts is shame. Again, that fear of being unloved. So here's where I want to just carve out just a little space, kind of sidebar, and at least speak to just the uniqueness, the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something wrong. Shame is, I am something wrong. Guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is the voice that says, I am a mistake. You guys hear the difference there? Can you feel it even? Maybe you can feel it. You know, guilt can be helpful, actually. You can feel conviction about something. It's uncomfortable. I'm not saying you enjoy it, but I'm saying it can be helpful. It brings about an opportunity to change. It can be motivating, help you even move forward. In fact, the Holy Spirit, one of the roles of the Spirit of God plays in our lives is to convict us of things that are broken. That there might be healing, that there might be freedom that we get to experience, that fullness, that joy. Shame is always 100% and forever unhelpful. It's destructive. You get stuck in that cycle of thinking and believing and then behaving that I'm not enough. I'm unlovable. And I'll never change. My, you know, my grandpa was like this. My dad was like this. I'm like this. I'm sure my kids will be like this. Man, do you see how the enemy shows up? To kill and steal and destroy. Not just your life, but would love to see it happen and ripple throughout generations. That's the danger of shame. You know, I owe a huge shout out to Brene Brown for her work and her research and teachings around shame and vulnerability. And, and there's a helpful image that she has in one of her books. And, 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 and it's this, it's this Petri dish kind of up in the upper left. We'll start there. You know, we're, we're, we're dealing with shame, we'll say, in an area of our life. Well, if you add these three ingredients, any of them, both of, two of the three or all three, it gets far worse. So silence. Secrecy, judgment. And what's it lead to? Oh man, shame's blowing up. It's just taking over your life. It's just unmanageable. It's just taking over. However, in this bottom, bottom left hand corner here, if you have that same shame, but you're exposed to really the antidote of empathy, then what happens? It's getting dealt with. This is where James is ahead of the curve, right? This is where we see the wisdom of Scripture, the truth of Scripture. What's confession do? Oh, man, can we put that back up just for one more minute um, or one more moment? Think of what confession requires. We just read it, right? There's another person. You're saying it. And as we'll see, the response from that person you're confessing to, you, you, there's, there's a sense of witness, of togetherness, not judgment. So now there's no longer silence. There's no longer secrecy. It's being spoken. And now, there's not a sense of condemnation. There's a sense of, of empathy, of an understanding that, hey, we're all human. None of us are perfect. Do you see how beautiful this is? And now, you know, like we have the research to point to it works. This is exactly how it works. You know, settings and times where I've experienced this is in connecting with another pastor and in and, and sharing with him, ah, I just feel like I'm not enough when people decide to leave. And he's able to say, oh, me too. There's that sense of empathy. Connect with a therapist. Just be able to say, you know, I'm just in a funk. Been dealing with anxiety and depression. 
And I don't feel judged for saying those words. There's no judgment for those things coming out of my mouth. Or to share with a friend, oh, I'm feeling sad and lonely because this happened. And they are just sad with me. There's compassion. There's empathy. And James gives us this of what we can do for and with one another. It's this next part of the verse. So admit your broken ways one to another. Again, we're each playing two roles here. And pray for each other. Pray for each other. I know some people are like, ah, you know, I think in the Greek that means judge or critique or fix. And I'll just tell you, you're wrong. It means pray, okay? It means pray. Pray for each other. Maybe by show of hands, a little engagement here. Have you ever shared something with someone and after sharing it, you actually felt worse? Like, worse about yourself, like more judged, more isolated. You actually wish, like, ah, I should have kept that a secret. Anybody? Just me? Oh, yeah, hands everywhere. Yeah, totally. Now, similar, have you ever been a person with, you had great intent in what you were saying? You, you wanted to say the right thing. You wanted, you, your hopes were to, like, you know, maybe help the situation somehow. And, and so you chime in. But the way you chime in, you can tell, like, oh, I think I made it worse. Anybody been there, too? Yeah. I'm just saying, it's not easy. We're not, not going to get this perfect. I think we can end up with this lie of, like, well, the answer is, maybe I just won't share anything with anyone ever again. That would be the wrong decision to make, okay? Being vulnerable is brave work, and yet it is the road to healing. I heard this from a friend. Do you know what unsolicited advice is called? Criticism. That's right. Unsolicited advice is called criticism. And you can end up hearing what people are saying, and as you're thinking it, you're like, wow, I'm an idiot. I'm definitely not enough. That shame cycle just starts really rolling. And this is called getting should on. That's right. Just let me slow down. I'll say that more clearly. Getting should on. I know, Pat, watch your language. Here, here, let me break it down further. Here's what I mean. Is when you're with someone and they're like, oh, you should do this. You should do that. You should stop this. You should start that. You should, you should, you should. Can we just commit? We're going to quit shooting on people at Overlake. Yeah, that's right. You can always share. You can always say, thank you for sharing. That was brave. How are you feeling? Have you been able to share with anyone else yet? Now, if that person invites your perspective, your wisdom, your advice, your experience on something, by all means. But that's different than pushing something on someone. I think we know that. And now there are times where outside intervention is the loving and right and necessary thing to do. In fact, as a church, as church leadership, the state of Washington is a little wonky. Uh, I won't get into that. But we have decided at this church, all elders, all pastors, we are going to be mandated reporters. Meaning if someone has shared or disclosed to us their intentions to be, hurt themselves, be a, be a, be a, a, cause harm to self or to someone else, and in particular even a child, that we will get the right authorities involved and make them made known. Today is actually Blue Sunday. I didn't even know what this was a, a year ago, but it's, it's one Sunday of the year where churches around the nation raise awareness to the uh, importance of preventing the abuse of children. Over Lake, I think we all know and agree, this ought to be the safest, most liberating, most loving place on planet Earth for every child. Where every child gets to flourish. Right here. For kids of all genders or races or backgrounds or abilities or nationalities or cultures, you get to flourish here. You get to experience the love of God here and be transformed by it. And then James ends here. And this is really where... It makes all the sense in the world. So admit your broken ways one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Confession is good for you. Quite literally, it's healing, not just as a spiritual reality. I mean it, it's healing. It's healing physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. 
There are medical benefits to confessing your broken ways. I wouldn't be surprised if you step into this and you realize that bad sleep gets better. That back pain goes away. Those stomach ulcers, you forget about them. You realize they're done. Heart disease, chronic anxiety, debilitating depression, headaches, all of these things. There's studies that show the importance of confession and forgiveness. And I'm no MD. I can't write prescriptions, although my handwriting would maybe say different. But, but I'm prescribing to, to, to those of us that are committed to the way of Jesus here at Overlake, two prescriptions today, all right? One, a dose of personal confession to someone that you trust, a safe person in your life. And then two, continue this journey of becoming a safe and entrusted person for others to confide in with their brokenness too. Think of who we might be if we stepped into this overlay. And not just assign it to a few staff positions or one little ministry or program here or there, but as a culture, we say this is who we are. And it's just simply biblical. It's just simply aligned with scripture. I'll end here. I'll end here. So in fact, actually the band, you can come up now. I'll wrap up here. I, I love how the pastor and theologian and ethicist Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote of confession in his, this little book. It's only like 100 pages. Life Together, talking about Christian community. Talked about confession at the very end here, the last few pages. And, and if you didn't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he, he was born in 1906, which means he lived through Nazi Germany. He was a Lutheran pastor. And, and a lot of people, they don't actually even realize the context of even the church at the time in Germany. But a majority of Protestant Christians actually were either in support of this Christian nationalist agenda and ideology, or they were just passive and silent about it. But there's about 30% or so that, and Diedrich Bonhoeffer was one of, they were part of the Confessing Church. I'll share a bit of why they named themselves that as well. But they weren't silent. And they weren't. And it ended up costing Dirk Bonhoeffer's life, if you knew this. He died at age 39. He lost his life in a POW camp days before Allied forces arrived to liberate. So it cost him his life. You know, I'm committed to, we, we want to be committed to learning from this aspect of our church history. That it not be repeated. And what he writes of in confession, and I love this, he says this in just one beautiful line. Christ became our brother in order to help us. And then he stretches it further theologically. He says, you know what? And because we are now the siblings of Christ and the siblings of one another, just as Christ bore our burdens on the cross through confession, we bear one another's burdens. Now, does that sound like Paul? One of the ways we're actually to be the church, to bear one another's burdens, is by participating in confession both as confessor and as a safe person to hear those things. Now, I mentioned the name Confessing Church. It wasn't because they were practicing this. They were. It was because, again, confession means verb, to proclaim, to declare. And what they were declaring is that Jesus is Lord and none other. That Jesus' vision is the greatest vision there is. No person, no party, no politic, nothing else can compete. No empire, no agenda. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And so that is what we profess today. So let's do this. Let's do this. As you came in, many of you received communion. Some of you maybe didn't. You, you came in another way or whatever it was. If you didn't get your little communion elements, just raise your hand. There's no, no shame. Don't, don't live in secret now. <laughs> uh, just raise your hand. We got some people rolling around. Keep that hand raised until you get what you need. It's going to look like this. I'll just wait till everyone has one. As we're waiting, again, keep those hands raised. There's two things in this. Don't open it yet, by the way. It's okay if you did. Again, no shame. It's fine. But don't open it just yet. There's two things in here. In the bottom, there's a little, little piece of bread, a little wafer. In, in, in the top, there's high-octane wine. No, I'm just kidding. A little juice. A little bit of juice. And these things are incredibly meaningful for the Christian community. This is incredibly meaningful because it is by taking these elements that we are confessing something. We are confessing a couple things. One, we're confessing we need this. 
We need the work of Jesus. We are broken. We have different ways in which we're broken. We're broken in ways we don't even know or understand. And yet we also confess, profess, declare that we are loved. We are forgiven. We are free. That where there is shame, bam, the work of the cross has come. So here's what I want you to do. Any more hands raised? Looks like we got to most everybody. Let's do this. Let's all, for all who are able, let's stand now. Again, don't open them yet. I know you're waiting. We'll get there. Just stand now. Find someone near you to swap with. And all you're going to do is this. You're going to say this. This is part of, we're, we're practicing, okay? You're going to say this. This is for you. And each get to say that, each get to hear that. Find someone now. Turn to someone now. This is for you. Craig, this is for you. Thank you. You can swap it a few times. This is for you. We get to say it, we get to hear it, and it's true. So now let's open the bottom where that little biscuit is. Open that. Little piece of bread. And I know it's small, but break it in this moment, being reminded that Christ was broken for you, that our brokenness broke him because of love. So break it and eat. That's powerful to eat something. You're saying, now that's in me. Christ is in us. You guys, there's nothing more intimate than that. We're saying we are filled with the life of Christ. Now open the top, that juice. And again, we're confessing something here. We believe we are forgiven. We are made new. We called out for help. And God said, here I am. And so now go ahead and take the juice together. Lord, we confess these things that while we are yet sinners, we are broken. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are made whole and made new. And so we thank you. We love you. We worship you. In your name, amen.